Okay, looks like we're live, but you all know the drill. Give us just a few seconds to let the proverbial stream breathe. Make sure we're getting green check marks across the board here. One, two, three, four, five, and we're good. Welcome in, everybody, to the Huddle Up podcast, presented as always by Mile High Huddle and powered by Overtime Media. I'm your host, Chad Jensen, and with me as always, my partner in crime, my fellow football priest. You know him, you love him. He is Zach Kelberman. Zach, Today, another kicked to the groin area for the Denver Broncos. Jarrell Casey is done for the season. Now, the backdrop to this story really quick, and then I want to serve this over to you for a gut reaction, is he actually tweaked it or perhaps even injured it. The, the, the main injury might have occurred week two, but either way, he, he tweaked it. It was bothering him all week from the Pittsburgh game. He still played because he's a tough football player. He's a veteran. He's a five-time pro bowler. Got out there, and there was a, a – point where he exacerbated the injury and you know so this morning they gave him an MRI turns out it's a torn bicep he's done for the season so that's five more pro bowls that go on injured reserve for the Denver Broncos and then adding a little insult to that injury is the fact that the off-ball linebacker the Broncos traded because of course right now you could really use some defensive line help you got Demarcus Walker Draymond Jones and now Jarrell Casey all on injured reserve you could really use some DL help but guess what they traded Christian Covington to Cincinnati to acquire, uh, what's his name, Austin Calitro. Almost forgot his name, and he has been placed on injured reserve after hurting his, mm. tearing his hamstring, whatever it was in yesterday's game. It just, when it rains, it pours, as you like to say. If one meme can summarize the Broncos season, it's the mole man football to the groin from the Simpsons. It's just every single time, every single injury, it's just another kick to the to the Netherlands, Chad. And uh, you know that with Jerome Casey, though, it, it sucks because he's a name player and he's a starter. But from a production standpoint, the Broncos really aren't losing much here. It's not that much of a loss. He has three pass breakups and a handful of solo tackles. He kind of was one of the bigger disappointments of the Broncos season, wasn't really impacting the games as much. And and Shelby Harris has vastly outplayed Jarrell Casey at a fraction of the cost. Chad, I would not be surprised if Casey played his final down in a Denver uniform. They can save almost $12 million next offseason by releasing him. No dead money. So uh, yep. no big loss there. The thing with Calitro, they picked up th two inside linebacker prospects, Barron and Calitro, to make up for losing Todd Davis. Both the guys they picked up are injured now, as opposed to maybe, you know, signing a natural inside linebacker like a Nigel Bradham who plays every year. This is the Broncos MO with Elway. You sign injured players and the players end up injured. It's rinse repeat every single time. I would, you know, here's the thing. We, I criticized Casey, of course, not knowing there was an injury yesterday. He made it into my loser section in the winners and losers following the Bucks game. And you and I even talked about it both on air and off air that, man, Casey sure hasn't made much of a dent since he arrived. I mean, they're stopping the run. That's the one thing the Broncos that can kind of hang their hat on these three games, and he's helping out and contributing in that way. That's not but why they got the, him, though. You know? But the only game he's made an impact, Zach, was that first game against Tennessee, and it turns out that was the only game in which he was fully healthy. So I'm, I, I think it is a big loss, especially considering the fact that if you still had Draymond Jones if you had either Draymond Jones or Demarcus Walker still active and ready to play, I'd maybe feel a little bit better about it. But the fact that you're not getting either of those guys back for another three weeks regardless, that means that Deshaun Williams is suddenly a starter opposite of Shelby Harris. That means – or McTelvin Ajim, take your picks, probably going to end up being Ajim. Well, I don't know, actually. Could could be Williams. And then they're going to have to go out and, and sign someone because – I'm trying to think. I'm racking my brain on the practice squad. I don't think there is another defensive lineman at this stage. So they're going to have to do something just to add bodies there, Zach, because, you know, it's NFL. Guys go down. People get hurt. Guys need, especially the big defensive linemen, they need breathers. That's officially a crisis. It's been, you know, it's been a, an epidemic of injuries. The Broncos have obviously not uh, coped with the injuries very well. They're 0-3, and yesterday's game was just a complete travesty. However, this is officially a crisis on the defensive line because now you're down. You got two of your three starters and your main backups injured reserve. Yeah, you know, uh, this is why, you know, I, I like the depth the Broncos had along the defensive line, and I liked Covington a lot. I'm surprised they traded him for a backup special teams linebacker who's now injured. I thought that was a good pickup, uh, the addition of Covington. Maybe Kaiser, who's on the practice squad, maybe he gets elevated. 
I personally, if the Broncos have to venture That's outside, right. you can't you can't start Deshaun Williams or Kaiser against a, a, an opponent in the NFL. Go out and get me Snacks Harrison. He's a free agent. He's a run plugger. He has some sacks to his resume. He wants to play again this season. He wouldn't come too expensive. It's I know it's a developmental year for the Broncos now. You're looking at who you can play next season, who you want to keep, but you still have to have starters for these games. You can't trot out Deshaun Williams and have no one behind him. So go get me Snacks Harrison just to plug the hole. You never really know. That was my first impulse as well. And by the way, you're right on that. De- uh, Deion Sizer is on the practice squad. My bad. And he was just re-signed last week, in fact. Um that was my initial impulse as well. Go out and get a guy like a proven guy like Snacks Harrison. The problem is, okay, the Denver Broncos have been reaching quite often of late, especially as it, as it relates to free agency. They sign a guy to replace this guy in free agency. Derek Wolf leaves. They they bring in Jarrell Casey. And when that when you reach like that, when you try and solve problems, um, oh, what's the best way? It's, it's not a grassroots um, depth situation for the Denver Broncos they don't have especially because the injury bug they don't have those third and fourth and fifth round guys over the last two or three years that can step into the gap so the football fates and the nature of football karma Zach is that unfortunately and I'm knocking on wood even as I say this is that my fear is you go out and you go okay we're in a crisis we need to pay some money bring in a defensive lineman who can start an experienced guy we're gonna go get Damon Harrison and then of course the injury bug says well Because you're reaching again, I got to bring you back down to earth. You're not doing this the organic way. Now, maybe that's me being a little bit too paranoid, Zach, but it occurred to me today after my first impulse was to to concur with you and say, go get Snacks Harrison. But maybe you just, at this stage in a crisis, maybe you just can't afford to think that way. You got to somehow stick your finger in the hole and and plug it, right? You got to figure it out. I do think the Broncos are a little snake bitten along the defensive line this season. But like I said, you need starters. You have to have players for you to still have what are the Broncos now? They're they're one in <laughs> they're one in two. You still have 13 more games left. You need starting caliber players. Uh, Marcel Darius is out there. You have Snacks Harrison. There's some veteran options. It, it looks like Fangio would rather, knowing his history by signing Kel, Kel, Kevin Tolliver, for example, he would get a guy from the Bears that no one's ever heard of to to, to just plug a hole on the on the on the active roster. But I like Snacks Harrison. They got to sign a player. I hope that'll happen soon. All right, guys, we want to get to a few other topics, including Vic Fangio is vacillating on the quarterback issue. We'll see what's on your mind. I see we got a few super chats stacking up from the MHH superstar. <laughs> I really community. say one and two, Chad. I'm yeah, thinking of the Cowboys just, right now. Uh, oh, and three. I had yeah, switchful wishful three. thinking. They should have been one and two. Uh, first, though, a qu- couple of quick <laughs> matters of business. This live stream episode is brought to you by sportsbetting.com. Broncos country, you know this is true. Gambling is now legal in the state of Colorado. Here's what makes sportsbetting.com a no-brainer for sports fans. They got sharp odds and low juice. They have in-house bookmakers. That means they're not a third-party provider of odds. You get the reduced juice. You get the best prices, hassle-free bonuses. You can roll it over at least one time. And 24-7 live customer support in the United States, a real person. And then here's the kicker. This is what everyone needs to know about right now. At sportsbetting.com, you can get a 100% risk-free week of sports betting up to 500 bucks. not just one bet, all of your bets. Play for a week, and if your losses exceed your winnings at the end of the week, sportsbetting.com will cover 100% of the difference up to $500 with a one-time rollover on that money. So head on over to sportsbetting.com slash milehighhuddle. That's sportsbetting.com slash milehighhuddle and capitalize on a risk-free week of sports betting up to five hundred dollars. All right, Zach. A couple of other quick things. Really, just got to go through the social media real quick. Make sure all of our new listeners and the audience continues to grow. How you can connect with us? Make sure you're following the podcast on Twitter at Huddle Up Pod. Also, you want to follow the main account at Mile High Huddle. If you have those two accounts followed on Twitter, of course, Zach, myself, you're not going to miss anything as it relates to the podcast, and you're not going to miss anything as as it relates to breaking Broncos news and analysis. Also, a gentle reminder, head on over to huddleuppod.com and get your swag on. Get yourself one of these MHH trucker hats. Get yourself a football priest hat. There are T-shirts. There's polos. There's hoodies. There's tank tops. We're getting out of tank top weather. But nevertheless, mugs, face masks, a little something for everybody. It's another way that you can support what we're doing here at Mile High Huddle. And if you're not in a position to patronize the merch store, it's all good. These three things, each and every one of you can do, whether you're listening live or in the chat room with us now, or after the fact as an on-demand podcast, subscribe first and foremost, which is crucial. 
like this video, especially if you're with us live, like this video, YouTube, Facebook in particular. And if you really love what Zach and I are bringing to you here on a daily basis, share this video out there. If you think we're doing a good job, share this on your social media, help us continue to grow and reach new like-minded Broncos fans just like you. All right, Zach, I know there's a few super chats that are stacking up and I want to get to them. But first, I just want to grab this one from Darvel on YouTube. He says, good evening, guys. Hope you both are okay. I believe this team is has bigger issues than the quarterback position. This team needs to clean house, uh, fire Elway, hold the front office, uh, I guess, um, accountable is what he's saying, and start rebuilding again. Zach, we we pumped the brakes on this very notion last week when the Broncos limped out to 0-2 in the wake of all the injuries. I'm still inclined to pump the brakes on this. However, that was such an ugly game. I mean, that was one of the worst Bronco performances I can remember. Maybe the worst. Nah, one of the worst since I've been covering the team. Of course, I've been watching this team uh, since I was seven years old. As, as someone covering the team, that was one of the worst. I can think to a few Josh McDaniels era crap shows from this team. I can think of 2011 when the Broncos got out to whatever it was, a one and four start. Uh, might have been two and four under Kyle Orton. There were some pretty bad games in that season. And of course, the last four years haven't been a cakewalk. There have been some ugly games, but yesterday's up there, Zach. And so what's your answer to Darville? Is it time for this ownership group, this trust to clean house and hold John Elway accountable, hit the bricks, Vic Fangio, you're done. As an aside, whenever you say the worst Broncos game in recent memory, my mind every time goes to that Dolphins game in, in 2017 with Vance Joseph when Adam Gase just wiped the floor with the Broncos. That and the Giants game that year, coming off the bye week. Anyway, I don't see how Elway would be fired because you don't have anyone in the position to fire him. Joe Ellis is not going to do that. And with ownership being what it is right now, all the infighting and squabbling, there's no leadership at the top. So Elway, again, makes his own job security. His contract is expiring in one more year. I think he's going to ride that out knowing no one's going to fire the Duke of Denver. He's pretty much untouchable despite year after year after year of playoffless football. I'm not ready to throw out Vic Fangio yet. I'm not ready to even throw the talent on this season. A lot of Broncos fans are acting like Drew Locke is done for the entire year. And the Broncos are going to go 0-16 and get the number one pick. He's coming back by week seven latest. I'm not saying playoffs, but they can still savage this season. I want to see how it's going to shake out. I want to see if Vic Fangio can adapt to this adversity, if he can grow as a coach, because the Broncos are not just evaluating the players, Chad. They're evaluating the coaching staff as well to see who stays and who goes in 2021 and beyond. I don't think it's time to reset everyone just yet. I'm also being realistic and saying that Elway probably has impunitable job security. It just is what it is. You know, if this were an 0-3 start and you were not dealing with the magnitude of injuries, I mean, again, it's not just Von Miller. It's not just Cortland Sutton. It's not just Drew Locke. It's not just your number one cornerback, A.J. Bouye, in which your whole secondary basically revolves around. It's all these guys and then some. Now Jarrell Casey. If the Broncos had gotten out to an 0-3 start under normal, traditional situation, then I think this would be a question that you'd have to more seriously examine. Yeah. Bottom line, though, is this week against the Jets, has the have the Denver Broncos beaten a an Adam Gase head coached team? I don't think so, right? This is the time where the, that needs to change. This is where the coin needs to flip in Denver's direction, and they need to go into New York and lambast this team with authority. Now, you're not going to be able to do it with Jeff Driscoll, in my opinion. You might have a snowball's chance in H-E double hockey sticks uh, with uh, Brett Rippon. We're going to get to that here in just a second. But first, got to grab this super chat from Mark Langley, one of the superstars in our community, longtime listener and uh, MHH Mount Rushmore member. Mark, appreciate you, dog. He says, what's up, my guys? Any injury updates on Locke and how bad is his injury? No, in, no updates up to this point that I've seen, Zach. Um, basically on lock, it's the Broncos did not put him on injured reserve for a reason. Now, keep in mind, injured reserve this year is very favorable to NFL teams, and that was done kind of lickety split right before training camp started as a, a, a response to the pandemic, right, in, in kind of trying to plan ahead in case there's an outbreak on a team and it maybe takes out one position group or something. And you've got you can put guys on the reserve list and they come back after three weeks. So in Drew Locke's case, they didn't put him on IR, even though arguably they could use that 
roster spot if he's truly not going to play for three weeks because they think there's a chance he can play in week two, in game two or game three. Not this game because of the short week, so it's going to be game three. There's a chance they think then, in other words, in week five against the Patriots, they believe there's a chance Drew Locke can return. It ain't going to be this week. Maybe, maybe if it was a Sunday game, he'd possibly, but I still doubt it, it's going to be week five. Best case scenario, Zach. Yeah, I, I still think uh, week seven versus Kansas City is the more likely uh, the landing spot for Drew Locke's return. And it could be uh, sooner than that. I just think it's a it's a point of pain management and where he is with his rehab. The good sign is, like Chad said, he he's not on IR, so his return is imminent. It's a short-term injury, not a long-term injury. Um, right before the bye week, week seven, I'm, I'm saying that Chiefs game, throw him out there, Chad. You're going to get obliterated if you have Rippon or Driscoll or maybe even Bortles. You have a snowball's chance, like you said, at least with a healthy lock in the game. All right, let's talk about the quarterback situation here because as we left you last night at the end of the gut reaction, Vic Fangio had said post game that he didn't know yet who was going to start week 4 because obviously he had made the decision to bench Jeff Driscoll in the fourth quarter. And in fact, we learned today as well, Zach, that they had considered the coaching staff benching him at halftime. They ended up sticking with him and lived to rue that decision. But Brett Rippon entered the game, and even though it wasn't perfect and his final pass was an interception, but it was kind of a what-the-heck-hell-mary type scenario. They weren't coming back to win this game, and it was fourth uh, fourth down on the, on the Tampa Bay 13. So I don't really blame him for trying to make something happen there. You can't really judge him from that throw. But he still went eight for nine, showed command of the offense, uh, did one thing in particular. There was a few things that you hadn't seen from Driscoll. One thing in particular, though, that, that Rippon did, Zach, is he was making – pre-snap checks to the protection, which, you know, I mean, the Bucks they blitzed 60-something percent of the time yesterday on the on passing downs, and at least Brett Rippon showed a an awareness of what was going on, and instead of just taking the snap and hoping he can get it out in time, he would change the protection, call out, make sure everyone knows what's going on. He still took that one hit, fumbled the ball, it was recovered. He did take that hit, but by and large, he was able to put himself, I think, Zach, in a, in a more fortuitous position to actually operate the offense. That brings us, though, also to Blake Bortles. Vic Fangio said today, basically, though, that he doesn't think it would be fair to Bortles with two practices under his belt. Today was his third to rush him out there on a short week and expect him to be able to really compete. So it sounds like Bortles is off the table, Zach. It's coming down to Driscoll and Rippon. They said they'll have a decision tomorrow. And don't be surprised also, he's, you know, they said they're considering even using both quarterbacks in the game, like planning to use both quarterbacks, which is an absolute joke. I think, I don't think it's actually Zach for what it's worth. I think that topic came up because he was asked directly, would you consider using them? And he kind of said, Oh yeah, it's a possibility. It doesn't necessarily mean the Broncos are strongly considering doing it, but he left it open as a possibility instead of crushing it down. So that being said, the table has been set. What do you expect to see happen this week at quarterback? I just have a few thoughts here. I mean, dual quarterbacks, this isn't college, and we're one step away from seeing the Wildcats. So hopefully that's gamesmanship on Fangio's part. They're not actually going to have two quarterbacks. You have to let one stay in the game. This isn't college football. Um, second of all, to your point, how sad is it that the barometer for a quarterback is take the snap and get rid of the ball really fast because you're worried about your offensive line? And in, Rippin did look incrementally better, but that was when the game was well in hand and the Bucks kind of slightly took their foot off the gas pedal. So I wouldn't say it's really fair to compare three quarters of, of Driscoll with the Bucks playing at 100% versus one with Rippin or ha barely one quarter, not even, and the Bucks kind of knowing they're in prevent defense and in, uh, winning victory mode. And I understand what Fangio is saying in terms of the battle or competition or whatever it is. But his rationale for yanking Jeff Driscoll and putting in Rippon was he wanted to see if Rippon could get the ball out faster. Here's an idea. How about protecting your quarterback better so he has more time in the pocket, more than one second, to get rid of the football? His line of thinking and his rationale and justifications for the quarterback position or the offense in general, Fangio, it's like a toddler. You think a defensive coach who studied offense going up against them for 40 years would know more about how offenses work. With every decision he makes and every time Fangio opens his mouth, you see why he was a defensive coordinator for decades, Chad. You got to go with your gut. I mean, you know, this is something a mentor taught me a long time ago, that if you go with your gut, you're going to be right nine times out of ten. Go with what that initial impulse is. And I'm not talking, you know, talking about making decisions, okay? In the case of Vic Fangio, his impulse was to play Rippon for a reason. That should tell you everything you need to know. If 
you're not convinced that Br that uh, Blake Bortles can you know slap enough reps together to viably compete on the road against a craptastic New York Jets squad. Real quick, let's grab this super chat from By uh, uh, Bison M. Welcome to the uh, manger, my friend. Appreciate you. Thank you. Make sure you reach out and connect with us on Twitter. And he says, uh, shout out to Boggins, Mr. Boggins. Everyone knows Mr. Boggins. Went to youth group with him. All right on. So Zach, this is some good old down home, old fashioned word of mouth. And we yeah. love that. So shout out to Boggins, uh, Mr. Boggins as well. And to you as uh, too, Bison, that uh, welcome in and keep, keep spreading the good word, my friend. He's a really good guy, that Boggins as well. We appreciate you. All right, let me see what else we got here from uh, Zeus McPeak. Zeus in the house. It's good to see you, my friend. Thank we always you. miss this when it's very rare that he's not in the live chat stream. We always miss you, Stu, when you're not with us. And, uh, you know, MHH, Mount Rushmore, first face up there, you know, really was one of the first guys there when we started. Obviously, this podcast has been going for a long time, and Zach and I had a lot of success with it as a podcast, just uploading it to – you know, Apple Podcasts, iTunes, whatever. But when we decided to take this and make it a live experience for our audience and for us, Stu was one of those guys that <clears throat> was there and helped us build it into a thing. So, Stu, we love you. Appreciate you, my friend. It's good to see you in the chat, as always. And then, Bison, one more time here, Zach. How much time will Elway give Locke to prove himself? Appreciate the super chat. Let's talk about that for a second because, well, do you see it real quick before we move on to Locke? Do you see it being anyone other than Rippon? Do you think the Broncos would go back to Driscoll? Because he, he, they already ruled out Bortles, it sounds like. Do you think that they would dare go back to Driscoll? You mean before Locke gets back or after? Yes, this week. No, I don't think you can put the, cor the cork back in the wine bottle. I, I think once you already benched him for that reason specifically, that's like the ultimate diss for a quarterback because you didn't get the, rid of the ball fast enough. So once you say that, you can't take that back. It's Bortles or Rippon going forward until Locke is healthy, in my opinion. Okay, so the topic of Drew Locke. Again, because things have started out so poorly for the Denver Broncos, a lot of fans who, surprisingly, I mean, they were really high and excited about Drew Locke. I mean, even in this community, we've seen the tonality shift in a large swath of our audience from the let him hate, we're all on the Drew Locke train, to he gets hurt in week right. two, the losses <clears throat> continue to stack up, and now it's like, let's talk about Trevor Lawrence. Everyone's kind of already moved on as if Drew Locke got hit by a bus, which right. he did not, right? As you mentioned earlier in the show, he's going to be back soon, and it's probably going to be, you know, possibly next week in time. It's going to be kind of a mini buy after the week four. You're, they're going to get 10 days to lick their wounds and prepare, and that's a lot of time for a young guy. What's Drew? He's 23, something like that. That's a lot of time for an injury to heal up and do its thing. You know, it's his throwing shoulder, so they're going to have to proceed with caution, Zach, but Drew Locke is coming back, and Bison wants to know how much time Elway is going to give Locke to prove himself. My answer to him is that he's going to get the remainder of the season or for however long he can stay healthy. Right. But it really, because of the fact that he got hurt in game two, unfortunately, instead of this being a you got a two to three week or two to three year window to prove yourself, basically the duration of your rookie contract, because this team has gone off the rails. Now they have to consider that we can get another franchise caliber guy in the draft. You got to prove yourself today. You got to prove yourself in 2020. I think that's probably going to be the mindset for John Elway and company. Yeah, right there with you. I think it's one big, long audition for Drew Locke as soon as he gets back into the starting lineup. And let's be realistic now. The Broncos probably are on a playoff team. Uh, the, the momentum they had and the expectation they had with Drew Locke before the season has to be adjusted accordingly now. So going forward, it's a developmental um, scouting rest remainder of year for Locke and for the offense and for everyone on this Broncos organization. But once he comes back to the field, like Chad said, as long as he stays healthy, he will get the rest of the season, good or bad, just so the Broncos can know, yes or no, are you the guy going forward? Can you, if you're not now, can you be the franchise quarterback? They had all the hopes in the world, Chad, and much of it was not Locke's fault. Injuries and opting out and all these things going on, you can't put that on Locke. So the Broncos want to see as much as they can – of a lock led offense just for 2021 and beyond. So they have some semblance of a de decision in mind before January, February rolls around. Jesse's point here on Facebook. Appreciate you being in the stream, Jesse. We all see the tank for Trevor comments. I think everyone's writing off drew way too soon. And if we are drafting that high, why not take Sewell, the top tackle in the class widely considered 
Tackle is by far the biggest need, and he's arguably the best OT prospect of all time. That's now I haven't heard that one yet. Thoughts? No, I mean, I think you're, Jesse, you're echoing what we just said there. And, you know, if Drew can prove himself and get back on track, and I mean, here's the thing with, with Drew, okay, is obviously in both games, in, well, especially in the Steelers game, and it was only a few reps before he got hurt, but he was trying to play a little hero ball, right? He was trying to, make something out of nothing when the pressure was instant and there, you know, really wasn't anything there. But as we talked about, I, I get that it was a small sample size. It was only five games last year, Zach, but he proved to be the hardest quarterback to sack for any QB that had at least 150 dropbacks in the 2019 season. And so what that means though, and you can see it, watch the tape, even week one, week two, before he got hurt week two, maybe is, is kind of the outlier because the pressure was intense and it was out of the gates. But if you watch his previous six starts, okay. This is a guy who has a natural feel for the pocket, has a natural feel for pressure, and he's got the mobility to buy himself time, which is why he was so hard to, for opponents to sack last year. What right. that means, though, is it takes pressure off of Elijah Wilkinson, takes pressure off Bowles, and Bowles has played well. And that interior trio that has really been struggling these last couple of games in particular, it takes that pressure off them. So, Zach, if you get Drew Locke back, you're not getting sacked six times per game. That's a guarantee. I can promise you. You're not going to get sacked six times per game if Drew Locke is back in the saddle. So that's encouraging. But hopefully he learns from this second injury so quickly into his NFL career, Zach, that you got to protect yourself. Hero ball, that's only for the clutch moment, and that wasn't a clutch moment. Yeah, I'm not about to victim blame right now. I mean, Locke's injury, it's, it's you know, 3 to 5% on Locke for not getting rid of the ball. And most of it's on the Broncos and Wilkinson for being incompetent in that position. I answered a question on Twitter today. Someone said, let's say the Broncos get the number one pick. What are they going to do? And I said, I would trade down a few spots, grab a King's ransom, and take Sewell the tackle. It's not going to matter who your quarterback is if you cannot keep him upright. You have Juwan James coming back next year. We think. We don't know what's going on with James anymore. You cannot assume anything about that man or his availability going forward at all. Garrett Bowles, what, what's going on with him? Is, is he going to get a multi-year contract? Will the Broncos resign him? What if he bombs the rest of the year? You're looking at a scenario where the Broncos don't have a left tackle or a right tackle. How do you justify having a Ferrari and not putting tires on it? That's what you would have with Trevor Lawrence. If you can't protect him, if you literally don't have linemen, it doesn't matter if Joe Cool's back there. So what I would do is different than what Elway would do. Elway sees the number one pick. He sees Trevor Lawrence. He hears wedding bells, Chad. He is falling in lust with the guy. That's where they would go with that pick. I wouldn't do that. I'm building up the line because, like I said, you can win with Blake Bortles if you have, let's say, a healthy Cowboys offensive line. You can win with an average to above average to good quarterback if you have a good O-line. Look at Simeon in 2016. Look at the record. Look at the production. As a seventh-round pick with less weaponry, worse coaching, he was protected for the most part very well. If you have an offensive line, the rest will come, Chad. I can go part of the way there with you on that. I do think that, you know, quarterbacks take pressure off an offensive line, the, the, the good ones. And you don't have to be mobile to do that. I mean, just look at Tom Brady. Tom Brady sees what, what's coming pre-snap and his – experience in the just the many thousands of dropbacks he's got in that two decade career you know his perception is preternatural when he's in the pocket and it does take pressure off your offensive line and even though drew's a lot younger obviously and in, in more inexperienced than tom brady i think that ex that that awareness and his pocket presence and hopefully he again he's got to learn from that because yeah it might be uh you know, you, you can, if you're not careful, you can find yourself going down the victim blaming road. If you're talking about, well, you know, he's got to, he's got to forestall from playing hero ball, but it's also true that you can't make an impact. You can't build a career in the NFL if you're constantly hurt. So what can you do as a player? What are the things you have control of the things you can do to mitigate that risk? And I think there are things that he can do. You're never going to be able to perfectly eliminate the risk of playing football and to, to injury and all that stuff. And a bad offensive line certainly, you know, raises those odds of the possibility of it happening. But I think Drew Locke does help this offensive line. If he comes back and he plays well, it's a non-issue, Zach, in my opinion. It becomes a non-issue. And fans, even if it's a still a losing product this year and they can't even get above 500, but Locke plays well and he looks like, even the quarterback that he looked like last year in those final five games, I think the Broncos say, you know what? We're cruising for a top five, top 10 pick at best. 
you know, we're going to go back to the well in terms of trying to build a nest. We still believe in Locke. But if he comes in and struggles or gets hurt again, they're going back to the draft. Not an issue on paper, though, but if as long as you leave Wilkinson in the game and Reisner, who's struggling, and Glasgow, who's struggling, you're going to see history repeat, Chad. So you can have a healthy lock back in the game, and you can have hopes and dreams, but as long as you have the same five guys protecting him and the same play calling and line of thinking, you're going to see the same results. It's insanity, literally insanity. We still don't know what the heck is going on there at right tackle. What Has DeMar Dotson really been that unimpressive in practice? Like... <sighs> Anyway, let's grab Mike here. He's been waiting patiently. Appreciate Mike Thank Evan. You, Mike. Still love the profile pick. One of our faves, my friend. He says, if you were Vic Fangio, what three player moves on the current roster would you make to improve our record? All right, Zach, here's your chance to make three moves on this team, you know, depth chart wise. What are you doing? Uh, number one, I'm replacing DeMar Dotson. Uh, that's number one. Uh, I'm Excuse me, replacing Wilkinson for DeMar Dotson. You guys know what I'm talking about. Uh, second of all, I'm probably getting Devontae Bosby more involved in the game. I'm probably playing him uh, well over Michael Ozemudia, who has his, his high points, but he's also struggling in certain fundamental aspects of the game. Um, I would probably cut Nick Vennett. That's my third roster move. He brings, I know it's a little bit of dead money hit, but he brings nothing to the table. And at least it would show accountability. Those three moves, Chad, we're putting the guys that are going to help us win in the position to help us win and getting rid of those who aren't. I'm trying to think of the first two that you said, I 100% agree with. I'm trying to think if there's anything I would do different than Van at, at this stage, because I don't think you move Cushenberry. He struggled the last two games no. in particular, but I think you got to ride that storm out, let him develop, let him go through the trial and error process, let him take his lumps. Um, safety, I mean, it's Jackson and, and Simmons are bust at this stage. Wide receiver, I mean, you're already down from your number one guy. It's all about Jerry Judy, KJ Hamler, and Noah Fant in terms of the tight end. I mean, I'll ride with you on that. I don't have any other third option yeah. that, in my opinion, would be would be a better move. With the current collection of players the Broncos have. Shout out to Chris Hernandez, one of the superstars in our community, 24 year veteran of the Air Force. If, I, if you're getting sick of me saying that, Chris, you just say the word, but that just impresses the heck out of us. Uh, yeah. Shout out to you, my friend. Appreciate the super chat. He's saying, hey, man, it's all love. Cheers. Keep your chin up. Stay positive. It's hard right now as a, as a fan base when your team is 0 3, but try and find the silver lining. Drew Locke will be back sooner than later. And you know what, Zach? It's kind of a morbid topic, but we have here coming up on Thursday night the opportunity to see potentially two of the well, two of the worst teams right now, but who's going to actually emerge as the worst team? Is it going to be the Jets? Is it going to be the Of course you got the you got the Giants mixed in there and I might be missing one off the top of my head, but we have this is kind of a curious situation because as we said yesterday following the gut reaction the wheels are starting to wobble on the bus. They're, they're about to pop off and the bus, the wheels fall off. If the game in New, in New Jersey against the Jets, if it ends up as a loss, the wheels fall off and then it really becomes dark, dark days implications. I mean, radio is already in Denver and, and local print talking about accountability at the top of the food chain in Denver. And if it happens there and they lose to Adam Gase of all people, who's, who's coaching for his job. Right. And so as, as sports fans, as as guys like us who are covering the team, like this is a this is a really interesting week, and it's a short week, but there are a lot of storylines. And even though it's two zero and three teams, Zach, there's a lot on the line this week. A lot, yeah. I mean, I'm not going to say Fangio would get fired if he loses this game, but you got to start having the discussion whether he's the right coach for this team at that point. If you're zero and three and you lose, even on a short week, to a, a such a dumpster fire of a Jets team with a quarterback who's playing worse than Jeff Driscoll, you have no business being an NFL head coach. So any Broncos fan thinking he's going to be fired after this game if they lose, it's not going to happen. But it's going to start planting the seed maybe in Elway's head. It's going to definitely rile up the media and the fan base. And you know what? If they do lose to the Jets, Chad, Fangio deserves to be on the hot seat. They have no business losing this game. None. Their talent is better even with the injuries. They should wipe the floor, even as bad as the Broncos are, with how bad the Jets are playing. And the good thing is it is a short week, and the cliche is you forget about a loss easier if it's a short week. You know, shorter turnaround time, you focus on the next opponent. They have to take out all of their aggression and all of their misery on this moribund Jets team. <laughs> good word. Good good uh, vocabulary selection there, my friend. Luis in Mexico proving wow. that Broncos country is not a geographic wow. location. It is a 
hashtag state of being really good to see you, Luis. And, uh, I'm trying to think tomorrow we're I'm doing the uh, podcast with the live stream with uh, Darko on Broncos MX Facebook page. So check that out, Luis. He says, hey, guys, all the way from Monterey, Mexico. Of course, Broncos country, state of mind. It's state of being, but it's all good. Just saw Wilkinson on the injury report. Do you think it's serious? Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> not, even, right. not even kidding. Here's here's the injury report for today. Uh, he is on the injury report with a knee, did not participate. Basically, any player, any veteran right now that's banged up at all, uh, they're not going to practice because it's a short week. Now, if it was a regular week, he'd probably he'd probably practice today. I've not heard anything that would lead me to believe, Zach, that there's a serious issue going on. But it could be the type of thing that could open the door for a DeMar Dotson insertion and give the Broncos plausible – I would say plausible deniability, but, you know, they've stuck to their guns with Wilkinson for so long, they can pos- plausibly now stand up and say, well, you know, he's banged up, so we're going to go ahead and play Dotson and then just kind of move on and turn the page. This could be that opportunity, but we just don't know the severity of that knee. How very Broncos replace the right tackle when he's hurt, but not replace the tackle when the quarterback gets hurt. Uh, I hope it's nothing serious for Wilkinson, all, all you know, all, all seriousness right now. But if it's bad enough where he's not 100%, whatever his 100% is, which is not a normal player's, um, I think Dawson should be next up because, again, it's simple negligence to have now an injured, horrible tackle now on your third quarterback, more than likely in Brett Rippon, to thrust him out there when he's not healthy. He's coming off surgery, Chad. It wasn't a knee surgery he had in the offseason. Um and- no, it's ankle. Lower, it's something ankle on surgery. ankle. Lower body surgery. So it's yeah. another it's another malady there. Why would you still have the guy in the starting lineup? But we'll have to see what happens. We jumping in. Appreciate you, my friend. Consistent every stream. I, I'm trying to think the last time you weren't in a stream, and it's not coming to me. So appreciate you, my friend. The amount of injuries surely can't be a coincidence. Do we need to investigate <sighs> Fangio's training methods? No, because that's, that's listen, I really don't think it's a Fangio thing because – this year in particular, the, the all of the teams were under the microscope with regard to the NFLPA and these new practice rules that they codified on the doorstep of training camp, including the Broncos. In fact, Fangio, when Justin Sternod got hurt, dialed it back. Like he was within the, the protocol of the NFLPA, NFL agreement of beginning the ramp up process of taking it from, you know, hour and a half to hour and 45 to two hours, the two, whatever the ramp up period was, I can't remember exactly, but then he dialed it back the next day. Cause he was worried. He didn't want to lose anybody else. To me, if there's anything, if you're going to draw any coaching implications from this, you got to look at strength, conditioning, nutrition, what's going on there, sleep patterns, all the things that Luke Richardson, the previous strength and conditioning coach was an expert on and, you know, you can't, you're, you're never going to bat a thousand when it comes to being a strength and conditioning coach there because football is such a violent sport. But those things are in question to me, right? How could you not question that? I know it's the pandemic and there was no OTAs and there was no preseason. That certainly is playing a big role in this. But you also have to look at past uh, the last three years, previous three years, might be four now, actually, that Richardson was gone and the new guys in. Those are the things that I'd be looking at if I were running this team, if I was the one at the top of the food chain, I would be examining that. I would be talking to other contacts across the NFL and saying, who do you have out there? Who can we talk to? Let's compare what we're doing now to maybe some other recommendations. At least start trying to kind of get a bead on, is there something we're missing here with our current strength and conditioning regime? Yeah, the problem is uh, Lauren Landau, and uh, I think I see the the, the pitchforks coming at me, Chad. I, the guy has just a cult following, and you can't criticize him or else you know you get all this pushback but this is consistent now for at least the last few seasons. It predates the pandemic. I understand everyone through the pandemic, everyone's injured in the NFL right now, but these were Broncos injuries, soft tissue, lower body that were happening years ago now. It's not just this season. It's a years old problem. I think Fangio is complicit because I've mentioned this before. He does like to have longer camp practices. He, he liked to have two hour practices. He would probably have two a days. He's an old school kind of coach. He pushed them a little too hard, but I think the majority of the blame, if there is any, is on the the conditioning. There is something Landau is doing. I don't know what. I'm not a strength and conditioning coach. That's not jibing with the Broncos players. It's just a consistent theme now. It's not a coincidence. It's a theme and a pattern. Or something he's not doing, right, that other teams are doing. Um, 
All right, Richie Rich jumping in. He says, I do not think the fan base has given up on Drew. I think the fan base has simply looked at the very real potential of us being in the top three in the draft. Well, right, but if you're looking at the being in the top three of the draft and you're entertaining strongly, not, and in some cases, Zach, we're seeing openly advocating for the drafting of another quarterback, yes, then you have given right. up on Drew Locke. Now, we're not saying that a majority of Broncos fans have taken on that perspective. That's not what we're saying. But it went from being a kind of a chirp coming out of week two to being a groundswell coming out of week three. So it's something that we, you know, have to keep a, you know, we'll keep a, trying to tamp down with whack-a-mole until we see Drew Locke out on the field again. But Bison M jumping in again, appreciate it. He says, I Thank feel you. good about Locke. Hope he gets the proper time. Zach, in yeah. your opinion, let's say he comes back and just stays healthy. Let's not talk about how many games the Broncos win. He stays healthy and, and starts all the remaining games in the season. What would the proper time be, in your opinion, to give Locke, knowing that this team, you know, they're probably cruising at best for a top 10 pick unless there's just some mighty stroke of, you know, football gods miracle coming their way. Ideally, he would get a full season with all his weaponry and linemen and, and coaching and, and not having a new coordinator, new playbook, no offseason. I would like to see Locke get a shot in a normal year with normal circumstances, but that's not how the NFL works. It's what have you done for me lately? He's going to get boring his health at least the rest of 2020 and even that's not enough because like i said the injuries uh, he was out for a couple games uh you you want a full sample size but the broncos will take what they can get and good or bad they're going to make a decision they're going to have to whether a lock is the guy for next season going forward i still don't think they're getting the number one pick i don't think they're going to be that bad this year top five debatable top 10 more than likely but top 10s out of trevor lawrence range so that's why I'm being realistic and saying Elway would probably take him, the Broncos would take him, but I don't think they're going to land in that spot. They're not going to be that bad this season. I think Locke is the guy when he's healthy until otherwise. Because, look, here's the players who are done for the season. Vaughn, but there's still a chance he could come back in, in December. Just don't count on it. Darrell Casey, Cortland Sutton. I feel like I'm missing one. Maybe that's it. Meanwhile... The guys that are on IR that you're going to be getting back in the next, let's say, two to four week window include Drew Locke, Draymond Jones, AJ Bouye, your number one Pro Bowl corner, Demarcus Walker, Lindsay. Mark Barron. You're getting a lot of these guys back. So, what Zach's point here is, you know, it's not just you're going to be getting Drew back and then, you know, let's make some hay while the sun is shining. You're getting Drew back, plus, you're getting a lot of other guys, key players back here in the very near future. Uh, John, throw Poppy back up. Let's give her some love there, and uh, appreciate you, Levi. Poppy, they, uh, you know, the, wow. she's she's picked up a nickname of her own in this community. Of course, Christy is the queen of MHH, as she is known in this community, and they're calling Poppy the princess of MHH. And Poppy, all yes. we can tell you is that, you know, your royalty to us. So thank you for your support, and thank you for your contributions to this community and to MHH overall. And we hope everything's going okay yes. with you and. And with your family, she says, thank you guys for all you do and go Broncos. Really right. appreciate that. And then, of course, very generous as well. It is followed up, seconded by Levi Hope, who wow. has just come out of the last two weeks or so, just been a whirling dervish, really uh, helping to keep this, this content coming to everybody. So thank you, Levi. Really appreciate your thank you. support and generosity as well, my friend, and the way you're contributing to the conversation in the chat as well. Uh, John, do you have... Geo, we can't miss Geo and Kenneth. If we have Geo, there he is. It's good to see him. It's just not, I know, of course, George is the biggest Queens Reich fan on the planet and one of the biggest Broncos fans on the planet, but his job doesn't allow him to be in every single chat stream like it did at one point earlier this year. So we're just happy when we do get you in the stream, George. And it's good to see you, my friend. Yep. Appreciate you. He says, I made it in tonight in my quarantine. I get a lot of time to read Bronco related articles. It baffles me how lots of fans have turned their back on Locke. We don't need Trevor Lawrence. We need protection for Locke, echoing uh, Zach here, bottom line. And, yeah, so speedy recovery, George, uh, everyone knows the word that shall go unmentioned. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's no respecter of persons that can strike anyone at any time. George, unlucky, reached out yesterday, in fact, and we we're juggling so many things. I'm glad you reminded me, by the way, George. Hope you're – Hope you're doing well and overcome that really quickly, my friend. But he's echoing you, Zach, that it's all about don't give up on Drew Locke. Forget about Trevor Lawrence. Let's see what happens this year. 
And, you know, provided he stays healthy, I think we're, we all believe in luck. He's going to do some good things, which means you get to the draft next year, even if you're top five, top 10, you're looking at how can we help Locke, not how can we replace him? It's just amazing how fickle football fans can be, not even Broncos fans, because this is just a sports fan thing where it happened with Philip Lindsay. He was the savior. He was the Messiah. And then Gordon comes along and everyone's saying, don't pay uh, Philip Lindsay. You can let him walk. Uh, Drew Locke is the truth. He's the franchise quarterback. He goes down. Now it's tank for Trevor Lawrence. It's just, let's pick one side of the fence to sit on and not be sitting in the middle. It's different for me, maybe. I don't think Lawrence is the next Andrew Luck. I don't think he's the next Peyton Manning. I think he will be a good quarterback at the next level, maybe even a really good quarterback. I just don't see transcendent, generational. And not only that, while I acknowledge the Broncos would likely pick him at number one, I just don't see the Broncos being at number one. So I can't put myself in that headspace to even entertain a tanking scenario or a scenario where they have the top pick to get Trevor Lawrence. So that's my opinion. Maybe I'm biased because everyone else is just drooling over him, Chad, as a prospect. I'm not. That's the difference. I mean, I think he's up there. I mean, there's nothing. I'm with you maybe a little bit, and then I'm not sure he's quite the same can't miss prospect caliber of prospect as Andrew Luck or even, you know, Peyton Manning going back 20 some odd years now. But it would be tough if Drew Locke does come in and struggles or gets hurt again. I mean, and you end up with a number one overall pick, you know, it's a real Sophie's choice. And I tend to concur with you, Zach. I mean, I think LA ends up doing that, but that's so many, you know, rolls of the dice down the board at this point. That Dominoes. It's, it's not even really worth talking at this stage, just because Locke is coming back. And until we see how he performs and how this team takes shape around him, Philip Lindsay, as you just mentioned in your last remark there, another guy that's coming back could come back as soon as this week. So let's just pump the brakes. You know, you might be saying goodbye to the playoffs in your heart of hearts, right? I mean, 0-3 is 0-3. But don't give up on the fact that this team could still play some, some meaningful ball in terms of, you know, evaluating Drew Locke, evaluating the young talent and whatnot. And still, don't completely slam the door until the Broncos are eliminated from playoff. You never slam the door, but you got something to say, Zach. Let me just say this. I, all I'm going to say, when Locke comes back and he has a 300-yard, three-touchdown victory, everyone is going to say, Trevor who? That's how fickle a fan base can be. So I'm going to put that out there right now, and I will say I told you so probably in week nine, week 10. Here's a good question for Zach, who one of his – duties covering the NFL is also covering the Dallas Cowboys for heavy.com. Kenneth Booker, appreciate the super chat, my friend you, and everything you mean to the community as well. He says, do we trade Justin Simmons to the Cowboys, which we know they want they're They seem to be out for a safety They're They've kind of been mm -hmm. tied to Earl Thomas. I mean, you're, you, you're, you've been on the inside of that more so obviously than any, any of us here, but what's your answer here for Kenneth? I don't see it happening. Uh, obviously, Justin Simmons wants a big contract. They didn't pay Byron Jones for money reasons. They didn't sign Earl Thomas likely for money reasons. I think Thomas is going to the Texans now. Um, the Cowboys are happy. It's not a Cowboys podcast, but they're happy with their personnel. I don't know how. They gave up a, a load of points the last couple of weeks. They don't really want an outside safety. Stephen Jones came out today and said they're happy with their on-campus guys. So Simmons to the Cowboys, no, not going to happen. All right, let's see here. I think uh, Bilbo Baggins says, I'm not giving up on the season. Drew will be back by the Chiefs game. Yeah, I think that's a pretty safe bet that he'll be back for in time for the Chiefs game. Whoop, sorry about that, John. We'll grab D DK, and then we'll grab the queen of MHH here. DK, David Kilgore jumping in. Really appreciate you, my Thank friend. You, and as you hear me say often, your YouTube profile pick brings a tear to our eye. He says, if we do still have a bad record at the halfway point, do you see us having a fire sell and trading players? Who? Unfortunately, everyone that's – not everyone, but most of the guys that would have value at that point in the season, they're on injured reserve, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I guess yeah. you got your Justin Simmons, and you could maybe look at Gordon. And, but Gordon's brand new to this squad. No, they're not moving on There's... from him that quick. And maybe a Philip Lindsay, if he's healthy enough to have contributed yeah. by that point. Please, I'm God, just no. spitballing here. But I just – I really don't see – the Broncos need every good player they can get – and they have cap space right now. I think they'll have cap space next year, especially because, you know, you're going to shed some of that money from Jarrell Casey in all likelihood. Wouldn't surprise me, Zach, to see Von Miller be asked and approached to take yeah. a restructure on his deal. And he might be amenable to it, you know, because 
hey, man, he, could, he, he probably wants to be a, a Bronco for life. He said so before. If it can help the team and if it can help continue to build and get back to a competitive form, he might be amenable to that. But what's your answer for David? What we, we mentioned this on the pod last night. What valuable assets do the Broncos have? It's like wading through a trash bag and picking out something from that. I mean, you're not going to give up anything for that type of material. Uh, I would maybe, maybe Melvin Gordon, but he's the bell cow for now. He's running pretty well. I, the Broncos gave him a lot of money for a reason. Uh, maybe I can't even Tim Patrick, a receiver. I mean, they don't even have healthy bodies right now. They don't have enough players to round out their game day roster. So I don't see a trade happening or a fire sale, um, especially at the positions where the Broncos are light, like offensive line and inside linebacker. I just don't see it happening. They have no one that anyone else would want, Chad. Guys, don't mistake what, what he's saying. It's not that the Broncos have no good players left. There is plenty of talent on this the team. The ones that are healthy. I mean, but what, what but, do you have? Teams don't trade rookies. They just don't, okay? They drafted them for a reason, and they sure as heck don't draft or trade the ones that have any value because those are the ones that are typically first, second, and third-round guys, and they're going to contribute today, and they want them to contribute long-term. What Zach's saying is the guys that are left over that aren't hurt or aren't on injured reserve, the list gets pretty small. Kareem Jackson, Justin Simmons, Philip Lindsay, maybe Tim Patrick, although I don't think he'd have much value. Maybe Deshaun Hamilton. Shelby I Harris? Think. I mean – Shelby. Yeah, he'd be. I wouldn't want to trade him, but you can't trade from your D line right now. You'd be screwed. Okay. So, uh, I agree 100 with Zach. Let's grab the queen of MHH jumping in, Christy. Always Thank good you. to see you, my friend, and of course, what you mean to our community. Thank you for your continued support. She says, "I'm sticking with Locke. Tired of year after year of fans dumping on quarterbacks before it's time. More problems to solve than that. Love. Thanks, guys. Yeah, I mean." That's Look, there's just so much more wrong with this team than the quarterback, but having a competent quarterback, even if it's too soon to call him a franchise guy, even if it's too soon, way too soon to call him elite, right? We can't say those things at this moment in time. He's competent, and a competent quarterback can raise those ships, maybe not at the same, you know, floating them as at the same level tide-wise as a bona fide guy like a Peyton Manning. You saw Peyton Manning do those four years he was in Denver, but Drew Locke can elevate a limited and beleaguered offense or, or roster, I meant to say, which, you know, it'll be curious to see if he can do that when he comes back. I agree with this sentiment. And it's uh, like you mentioned, Chad, he didn't get hit by a bus. Locke is not dead. He's not even after the season. He's going to be back in a few weeks. And knee jerk, impulsive reaction and decision making is how the Broncos got in this mess in the first place. Ride it out at least one. Uh, you know, majority season with your potential franchise guy and then make a decision from there. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater with a four and two quarterback who had all the promise in the world before his injury. Alvin wants to know, do you think Drew is done? No, we really don't. No, we don't. And he's going to be back soon. This is what I in mean. The, in the back of your mind, you, you hope he doesn't get rushed back, but the Broncos kind of have to rush him back because if it continues to steamroll like this and the wheels do fall off, they need to get an evaluation on him because they could be in true competition for the number one overall pick. So that temptation, my point is that temptation could be there, especially if they lose this coming game. If they do lose to the Jets, that temptation, that urge, you know, it's it's going to be there for that impulse. Uh, and our, our friend David Bingaman, <clears throat> bottom line, we don't have a franchise quarterback until proven otherwise. I hate to say I, it. Agreed. But can we say this? Tell me if tell me if you can say this with a straight face and with perfect credibility, Zach. Drew Locke, up to this point in his career, despite the injuries, has shown some franchise caliber tools. I can say that with a straight face, perfectly confident in being able to say that. That doesn't make a franchise quarterback, but they are tools in the tool chest and part of the equation that eventually adds up to that. So he still needs to put it all together, David. Your point is not lost on us. And uh, hopefully he gets the opportunity, and we think he will this year, to kind of answer that. Like, I think we're going to know, even though it's going to be less than ideal in terms of so many of the best players on this team are going to be have been gone when he returns in terms of Vaughn and Sutton and Casey that could help take some of the pressure off him and allow him maybe to operate with a little more freedom and a little bit less onus and a little bit less pressure, but still – you're going to get a good look at him when he when he returns. I'm really not doubting that at this stage. 
he has traits. That's a perfect way to put it. He's not a franchise quarterback. He has a, a ways to go, actually, before he is one, a bona fide one. But he does things that some other quarterbacks can't do, tangibly and intangibly. And that's why we were all hyped on uh, the Drew Lock bandwagon. We were all big number three fans. We thought he was going to be the answer to quarterback. But what have we seen from him this year? Not even two full games with a less than full supporting cast. So can we at least give him the rest of 2020 when he gets back and then form a basis of opinion around number three? Can we just do that at least? Fair. Nathan Kim jumping in on Super Chat, a name we don't recognize. Welcome, Nathan. Welcome, my friend. Appreciate your support. You. We also got to grab Jess jumping in on YouTube, one of our Super Chat superstars. Thank you. Appreciate you. And Jess, every time I do the shout out on Twitter after each episode, I'm searching for you on Twitter. I can't find you, dog. If you're on Twitter, make sure you reach out and connect and let me know who you are so that we can include you in those shout outs and tag you. Appreciate you. He says, where's the front office <clears throat> that built the 2011 team? Gone. So, well, Brian Zanders is long gone, right? He was the official GM for the 2011 draft, which did bring in some serious studs for the Broncos, obviously Vaughn, but you had Orlando Franklin who, really contributed big time that rookie contract as a second round pick Raheem Moore. There's one play that we'd all pr prefer to forget, but aside from that one play, he was a solid starter out of the gates for the Broncos. You keep going on down the line to Julius Thomas, Virgil green. I'm missing someone. Uh, someone will find, will tell me probably Kenneth Booker will tell me in the comments here, but uh, Elway's still here. I mean, Elway, here's the thing. Elway's had a, a tough time, Zach lately in free agency and his, discernment and analysis evaluation on coaches <clears throat> is highly question in question right now, but you got to still hand it to him that these last three drafts have been good draft classes that have really helped stock restock the shelves. Because can you imagine what this team would be going through right now? If 2018, 2019, 2020 draft classes were the same or similar to caliber wise as 2015, 2016, <laughs> 2017, yeah. good God. Yeah, it's pretty brutal. And also the Broncos and Elway, they lost Adam Peters to the 49ers and John Lynch. That was one of Elway's right-hand men, along with Matt Russell. Uh, some of the nucleus is still there, and I got to give it to Elway like Chad just laid out. The 2017 draft class is one of the worst I've ever seen. And Elway rebounded immediately in 2018, hit it out of the ballpark in 2019, and it looks like in 2020 it's a little too soon. He's going to have some playmakers for a long time. His drafting has gotten better. If only he could pick a quarterback and a head coach, so... He's almost there, Jeff. Let me grab this question from Rick on Twitter, who was looking for a Philip Lindsay update. Appreciate the question, Rick, and thanks for joining us on Periscope. So Lindsay is trending in the right direction. He did practice today. Remember I said most guys, if they're even banged up on a short week, they're getting a rest day on that first practice. Well, Lindsay, because he's basically been resting these past two weeks or so, he did practice today as a limited participant, which is – uh, promising. And here's what Fangio said specifically about Lindsay and Thursday night quote, <clears throat> he's trending in the right direction. He might be able to play Thursday, but we'll decide that as we go through the week, if he does play, he would be on a play count. He can't get, a, uh, he can't get it uh, the rock a bunch of times, but he can get in there sparingly if he's able yeah, to he's go. Playing. So Zach, <clears throat> there's a chance he could play, but honestly, I think there's an even stronger argument to be made that you, you've gone without him this long. If you can, afford to go one more game because then you get 10 days right in between mm. week four and week five you might as well do it and make sure he's back back when he comes back you can do that if you're one and two or if you're two That's and true. one but you're oh and three this is a, a literal must win game for Vic Fangio if only to hold off the hot seat if you lose to Adam Gase and the Jets in prime time Lindsay or no Lindsay, you are in serious trouble. So I think Fangio, even though he knows his job security is pretty safe, he's going to kind of turn up the heat a little bit in, in a game he has to have. So I think we will see Philip Lindsay. I think he showed his hand there. He's not going to start him. He's not going to have a big role, but he will be on the field in third down situations, passing situations. They will get him the ball. I think Lindsay does play on Thursday. You know, that's one thing that you could clearly see in week three that was missing from the equation is just some fire, some spirit, some swag, some confidence, some leadership, big talent kind of leadership. Yeah, well, yeah, but <laughs> Lindsay, Lindsay brings that to the table. So even if he only comes in and touches the ball five times, having him suited up, having him in there, John with guys, having him on the sideline, actually yeah. suited up, not in a hoodie <clears throat> and a face mask. I think would be a, a big time emotional asset for the Broncos. 
Edward Keating jumping in, one of our superstars. Thank rocking you, the hat, rocking the T-shirt like a boss. Much love and respect to you, Edward, and appreciate your generosity, my friend. really means a lot. He says, Locke is the guy, fix right tackle. I don't care who the quarterback is. With a bad O-line, your quarterback is not going to play well. Also, Preach. I am not on the Fire Vic bandwagon yet, but if we lose to the Jets, I will be saying Fire Vic. Put Dotson in now, Denver Broncos for life. Hey, man. All caps. <laughs> yeah, love <it. clears throat> I love that, man. It's like when I communicate with you know, my uncle or – or older folks, the boomer generation will say, God love them. I love the boomers, but for what it's worth via email, the replies are always in all caps for whatever reason. I never, <laughs> I never understand. Why but are you ever, yelling at me? <laughs> yeah. I mean, let's start with what you can, what you can change today. You can't get locked back today, but what you can do is make an honest attempt to fix a problem area. Right tackle has been one of those problem areas consistently dating back to all 12 games that Elijah Wilkinson started last year. And I get last year, you had no other better options. You saw that when you finally said, all right, you know, he's hurt. Let's play Jake Rogers, whatever that was. I want to say week 16, he started at right tackle. It might've been 17, but I think it was 16 against the lions. You had no choice, but to go to Rogers in that moment. This year, you do have a choice. You do have a viable backup alternative, Zach. And it's DeMar Dotson who has been a starting right tackle in the league for the last eight years. So, I understand why fans right now are fed up and don't understand where it's obvious from the outside looking in, there is an opportunity to improve the team. There is something this coaching staff can control in terms of taking a step forward toward improvement and they're not doing it. And it's frustrating to see people don't understand it. They'd rather change the quarterback than change the right tackle. And if we were not covering the Broncos, if another team did this like the Jets or the Dolphins, we would be crucifying them right now. We would say that about how their coaching is so mishandling the situation, a quarterback and their protection. It starts up front. To say the game is won or lost in the trenches is not cliche. It's the truth. It starts up front. You have to protect your quarterback. I don't know what it is. My theory is that Mike Munchak is just smitten with – Elijah Wilkinson and Vic Fangio not having an offensive background. He puts a lot of stock into what Munchak thinks. And if Munchak says he's the guy, then he's the guy that has to change. And that's where it falls on Vic Fangio as the head coach to step in there. Like he did with quarterback and replace the right tackle. Who's now injured. It's bad enough that he's, he's bad. Now he's injured on top of that. Come on guys. Big Kevin Peters, uh, Kevin Peterson, by the way, who could not stay with us for the stream, saw that super chat. Shout out to you, Big Kev. And uh, we'll see you in the next one, man. We'll see you Wednesday night, hopefully. And maybe I'm sure you'll be in the stream tomorrow night for building the Broncos. But uh, let's grab this super chat from Black Knight 232 longtime listener of the show. And uh, always been helpful anytime I've needed something and need a little help trying to figure out Twitch. He was there to help me out. Really solid dude. Appreciate you, my friend. He says, man, talk about crap luck. But the Broncos got what they deserved, not fixing the right tackle spot after Jawan James opted out, not getting a good coverage linebacker, questionable coaching, and a GM ownership trust that's oblivious to what's going on. So, again, part of our responsibility as your football priests is to help you exercise the demons. Sometimes you got to get it out. You got to work the hormones out. You got to get it off your chest. There, You know, I maybe take a little bit exception of, of the last thing you said there, Black Knight, in terms of the GM yeah. trust at this stage. However, I can't argue with the fact that, well, you know, they did make a move to fix right tackle and add some depth there when James opted out, but they haven't utilized it in the face of a massive sample size of, to use the emoji you so aptly inserted here, <laughs> crap performance from Wilkinson. So that I can 100% Zach agree with. And the good coverage linebacker, they tried. The dude got hurt. What else are you going to do in terms of on the doorstep of the season? How about signing a traditional linebacker? I mean, anyone, Chad, Nigel Bradham, there were guys out there. I mean, I, I pick a bone with that, but yeah, I, I, Black Knight, I don't disagree with anything. I don't think Elway's oblivious. I still think he's very stubborn as a general manager. I think he what he thinks is best is what happens, and it's his way or the highway. I think that's how Elway operates. It's for that. We saw that come out with the Simmons negotiations. And yeah, in 2020, you know, hindsight, he made the right call, it looks like, through three weeks. But that's him. That's Elway. It's just it's his way or the highway. The rest of it, though, I'm glad more people are catching on to the coaching chat and the questionable decision-making and the personnel decisions. For whatever reason, for five years now, they cannot find a right tackle and a coverage inside linebacker. They're just two major bugaboos for whatever reason. 
All right. Shout out to Mr. Boggins. John, if I need to, I can grab him his super chat off of uh, YouTube if we need to, but I want to read his comment if possible. And in the meantime, I'm going to grab El Tito jumping in. New name to super chat that we don't recognize. Yeah. So welcome. welcome. Thank you. Appreciate you. Reach, make sure you reach out and connect with us on Twitter. I appreciate your guys' hard work, he says. Thank you. Last year we started 0-4. The season is not over. A short week to start turning things around. Let's go, Broncos. That's a good point, Zach, because last year the Broncos, of course, started even worse than they have up to this point, going 0-4 before they finally got their first win. And if you were smart enough to not – because remember, they slow-rolled the Drew Locke um, – IR thing. He was healthy after the first Chiefs game. Like they could have put him in then, but they waited. They waited. Right. They waited. If they would have made the decision to put him in three weeks earlier, which they had the chance to do that three games earlier, he was healthy and he, uh, I'm sorry, he started week 13. So week 12, 11, 10. Yeah. So he, he'd served his eight games. If they had done that, they could have potentially beaten out the Tennessee Titans by virtue of the fact that they shut him out in week six for that wild card spot despite the fact that they they started 0-4. So I'm not saying that to suddenly get your hopes up. All I'm saying is El Tito is right that you can't completely slam the book on it yet because, you know, one thing quarterbacks, if it's the right guy, you know, certain quarterbacks, they bring a magical component to the scenario. And I'm not in any way making that as a bold prediction for Drew Locke, but you saw it last year when he entered the fray coming back off injury. It was a magical influence and lift that he provided this team I mean, they went from winning what was it, Zach? Three of their first, um, three of their first eight games, to winning four of their final five. So you just can't, you don't know how it's going to shake out. That's why, really, try and pause the fatalistic. You know, it's all over. Yeah. Number one pick, fire Elway, fire Fangio. You got to wait till you get the quarterback back. And once you do, if it continues to be a crap show, bring all those issues back to the table and let's really dive into them. And the injuries, you know, looking at it realistically, you might have to adjust your expectations. You might have to, you know, not circle playoffs on the calendar this season, as tough as that is. But there's still 13 games left, and Locke is coming back. They can still do something. They can make noise. They can maybe pull out a winning record. But most importantly, Locke is going to get an audition to show that he can or can't be the guy. And boring playoffs, I mean, that's the second most important thing is, is knowing for one way or the other if Locke is the franchise quarterback. And he'll have an opportunity to show that. So don't slam the door on the season yet. He's still coming back. They can still upset some opponents. They can still win some games. You can still have some highlights this season. And you never know. It's 0-3. I'm not saying they're going to make the playoffs, but crazier things have happened. If they beat the Jets, you never really know what could happen going forward. Levi Hope jumping back in. Really appreciate you, my friend. He Thank said, you, when Locke comes back and dominates, can we get a shirt that says tank for who? <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Hey, dude, you got it. That's a promise, okay? That's a promise. Uh, Mr. Boggins, appreciate the super chat, my friend. Thank you. Appreciate the great word of mouth that you're spreading out there about the Huddle Up podcast. Salute, my friend. He says, hi, hashtag dumpster fire. That's all. Bye. And look, here's what I wrote on Twitter after last night's game. Following, I think it was after I published the uh, winners and losers. Something to the effect of, you know, there's a there's a there's a spark smoldering at the bottom of the garbage in this dumpster. It hasn't quite caught into a full dumpster fire conflagration quite yet, but it's smoldering and burning. It has the chance to catch it at any given moment, Zach. If they lose to the Jets, it's going to catch. And the wheels, whatever, find whatever analogy or metaphor you want to use. Wheels falling off a bus, dumpster catching on fire. That's the pivot point. If they, but they can forestall that. This team can find the resolve and the self-pride and all that stuff, and confidence and some swagger to say, look, we're the Denver Broncos. We're not going to lose to an 0-3 Jets team, even though it's on the road and it's on the East Coast. We're not going to lose. And they get that win. It can be that spark. It can be a lift that can turn the ship around. So that's why at this stage it's it, you just can't – and I get what you're saying, Boggins, and, and you're exercising some demons, but I'm not ready to call it a dumpster fire yet. Yeah, right. Yet is the operative word here. And sometimes you have to beat up on a bad team to feel good about yourself. And that's what that's what it comes down to. So much of the NFL and so much of sports is mental. And you can argue that most of it is actually mental. If the Broncos, let's say, have a win on Thursday night, and if it's fairly convincing, 
you know what? It is the Jets, but that's one in three now. It's it's a winning streak of sorts. It gives you some momentum going forward, and you start to say to yourself, hey, we, we put one together. Let's put another. And that's how things build from there. Knowing your quarterback is coming back, showing that you can win without your quarterback, even if it is against the Jets, it's so important from a mental and confidence standpoint to just to stack one victory and then go from there. But on the tail end of that, Chad, if they do lose to New York, uh, how do you not look at this and say it's not burning down completely? Yes, I, I, I'm with you on that. <clears throat> All right, we're almost out of time here. Let's grab Dennis Woods, who is consistent as the day is long, always in the chat, always supporting what we're doing here. Thank you, Dennis. Page. Love you, buddy. He says, if we lose to the Jets, I wouldn't bet against getting the number one pick. In my opinion, I would not take a quarterback in the first round, though, unless Drew bombs the rest of the year, which he's saying is not likely. In other words, he's not. he doesn't see Drew coming back in and sucking it up for the remainder of the year. So, uh, hey, man, we're, you're basically, at this stage, you're echoing how we view it with the current lay of the land. Now, again, if they lose to the Jets, if Locke come back, comes back and sucks it up, that changes the conversation completely. Yeah. you got new information now, and you maybe have to make a different determination, but we're not there yet. What's great about this, though, is Locke has his own future and really the Broncos' future in his hands because he can control whether the Broncos end up with the top pick or near the top pick, and that, by association, would influence their decision on the quarterback like Trevor Lawrence. So if Locke plays well, not only does he stave off Lawrence or Fields, he buys himself likely time as the 2021 starter. So it will be an audition. What he does over these next, when he comes back from Week 7 going forward, if he stays healthy, he will show – if he can be the guy or if he starts losing in bombs, whether they're going to be in that top five discussion. And if, let me say this, as big of a lock fan as I am, if he comes back and he loses and he looks terrible, I will get on the quarterback train, but not a second until then. Well said. RIP TG. We have learned, I have since learned since last we saw RIP TG in the, in the chat that this is TG's brother. Now, those of you who've been with us for a long time know perfectly well who we're talking about in TG great superstar member of the MHH community foundational guy that suddenly we don't know the story uh, is, but no longer with us. And uh, RIP TG, I would love it if you would email me milehighhuddle at gmail.com and uh, just give me some backdrop, give me some background. Just, you don't have to share, to, you know, personal information or whatever. I'd like to know what happened to TG and Zach and I would like to know if there's anything we can do to, to help yes. you, to help your family. But thanks for being with us. And here's his comment. I love how people are hating on Drew Locke when he's playing with a lawn chair right tackle and two rookie wideouts. And, you know, that's true. I mean, even Locke obviously didn't play great in the fourth quarter in that Tennessee game, had a chance in the four-minute offense, didn't work out well, and then kind of pressed a little in the Pittsburgh game before, you know, eight reps, whatever it was, before he got hurt. No Cortland Sutton through – Basically, but both those, I guess he did have Cortland Sutton to begin. He had that one connection, but still the point here, two rookie wideouts, Zach. So we'll see. I still think there's enough talent there though, for, for Locke to make plenty of hay. But no off season either to work with those rookie quarter uh, receivers, Chad. I, I mean, he had the deck stacked against him. No preseason, a new playbook, a new coordinator, new coaching, all these new personnel moves and, and teammates. It's, it's a tough p position to be in. And, and the final cherry on top of the crap Sunday was having Wilkinson as your right tackle, was not making that one more step to put Dotson or a better right tackle in the game. That, that's really what it comes down to for me. All right, guys. As Glenn says here, everyone loved Drew Locke the Saturday before the Steelers game. Yes, what changed, exactly. <laughs> what changed? It was an injury. And so, you know, give yourself some perspective if you're feeling that kind of panicked feeling and you're talking about tanking for Trevor. Give yourself some perspective because Drew's coming back and it's going to be fun to see – how it all shakes out. Once again, it's another audition, but Drew always knew that this year was going to be an audition. He's, you know, as a second round guy, he's always going to have to audition until he gets that second contract. So, all right, guys, we have to get out of here for tonight. Thanks to each and every one of you for spending some time with us. Raul, I, I disagree. Quite, I, I'm not with, there with you on the Broncos are not better than the Jets, but uh, we'll, we're off tomorrow night, Zach and I, but there will be a fresh episode of Building the Broncos with Nick Kendall and Carl Dummler. You guys are not going to want to miss that. And then Zach and I will be back in the saddle Wednesday night, 6 p.m. Mountain, 8 p.m. Eastern. Remember, there is a live Mile High Huddle podcast stream seven days a week. It's every single day from 6 p.m. Mountain to 7 p.m. Uh, Mountain. And that is unless and 
we're in season. During the season, there's only one exception to that, and that's game day, which it's either a Sunday, a Monday, or Thursday, and those are all three days that Zach and I cover. So on those days, you get a podcast directly. The live stream comes directly following the game, the gut reaction, fresh off the cuff, emotions raw, analysis fresh, all that stuff. So remember that. Every single night, you got a Mile High Huddle podcast, 6 p.m. out and 7 p.m. That hour, block it out and continue to keep bringing that conversation. Sound off. Keep the conversation going. And speaking of keeping the conversation going, gang, we're going to be un, uh, unveiling, I guess is the word I'm looking for, a new competition Okay, that's going to be coming out, a promotion of sorts, that's going to have to do with people being active on the comments at milehighhuddle.com. We need all this great Bronco country passion that's in our chat stream and in these live podcasts every single night at milehighhuddle.com every single day, engaging on the articles, keeping that conversation going in the comments at milehighhuddle.com. So on Wednesday, we're going to announce what that is. We're going to be doing some giveaways, some contests for commenters and people going over there to continue the conversation, some swag, some different opportunities to come on the show with Zach and I. So stay tuned for that. We'll unveil that on Wednesday. But in the meantime, get in there, get over to milehighhuddle.com and get some Keep, help us keep the conversation going. So many of you have, and so many of you are, and props to you for that. But if you're not one of them, come join the conversation. Screw Twitter. Screw all the other social media. Come join the actual conversation on the site with us. And then, Zach, one last one here from George, and then we're out. He says, I appreciate you, Gio. Thank you, George. I think Drew worked with Mike Shanahan. Wor- excuse me. I think Drew working with Mike Shanahan would be lights out. Pull the trigger, John. Demote Fangio to D.C. Hire Mike as head coach. You know, in a fantasy world, that sounds great. And I don't say that to demean your what you're saying there, George. Just from a realistic perspective, it's not going to happen. Like Joe Ellis already said, yeah. if, if, if Elway You'd wants to, to hire him. Mike Shanahan, go through an entire uh, hiring process, interview multiple candidates. And if he emerges as the number one guy, then go ahead. You know, we'll have the conversation. But that's just not going to happen in the middle of the 2020 season. Plus, you don't demote your head coach to a lesser position. He has to work under a new coach. I mean, they'd fire him. They wouldn't demote him. I, I would love to see Shanahan, uh, either Shanahan, Kyle, or Mike, but it's just not realistic. All right, guys, we're going to get out of here. Make sure, though, you are connected with us, especially if you're a Super Chat superstar on Twitter. Uh, follow my partner, Zach Kelberman, at Kelberman NFL, myself, at Chad and Jensen. Also, the main podcast account, at Huddle Up Pod, and then at Mile High Huddle, plus our producer, John. In fact, let's bring him on Pop real quick. Say hi to everybody. There's Papa John there in the house. There he is hey, in all his glory. Follow that man. On Follow Twitter. him. Follow. You can see Stop. at John K M H H. John, a very lively conversation in the chat stream today. What do you expect to see? Let's let's get a bold prediction from John. What are you going to see from this Broncos team Thursday night? What are you thinking? I think you're going to see a lot of mistakes again, except there's going to be more penalties. You're just going to see mistakes in terms of penalties, a lot of them. Okay. Can't wait for well, that. Yeah, fun. <laughs> we're on we're on bated breath waiting for that one. Uh-huh. But nevertheless, John, appreciate everything you do on the chat stream, keeping the uh, keeping the chat flowing and doing what you do. So, all right, guys, we got to get out of here for tonight. Mile high salute to our super chat superstars. We love you guys, our Facebook supporters, all of you that are are really showing up for us. And you know, to each and every one of you that joined this conversation live, we love you, appreciate you. For Zach Kelberman, I'm Chad Jensen, and also for John, we'll catch you. The three of us will catch you Wednesday night, six p.m. Mountain. Uh, 8 p.m. Eastern.